know we're in this thing. Uh, I'm glad I'm here tonight. I, I never <laughs> saw him this high in the Soviet Union. <laughs> well, sure. I don't, then I won't ask you that question. I'll ask you another question. Let's get back to what were you telling us in your series of articles in Science and Mechanics? Did you consider the, the whole Russian space program to be, you know, fraudulent? No, I didn't say that. I consider what their, their entire man space program uh -huh. is a fake. It's a fake. Yeah. Right. And how did you learn this, Mr. Mallon? I learned it the hard way, first of all, before I went over I there. Do everything you do is the hard way, but keep going. <laughs> they do make it harder. That's how I realize that. <laughs> keep going. No, before I went over there, I believed everything I read in the New York Times or Aviation Week or even in astronautics, aeronautics and astronautics. Or even science and mechanics. Or even science and mechanics, that's right. I believed this, and then I went over there on an assignment. And I received one shock after another. I mean, they're electronic equipment, by the way. Oh, I thought you were going to speak of the Russian girl's ankles. They are a little sick. <laughs> well, that's true, except, uh, and they aren't very pretty. That's another bit of propaganda. There are a few who are, only a few. Do you enjoy expertise in that area, too, Mr. No, no, no this is not. Just the so let's, of... let's stick in the things that, that you really are an expert. <laughs> All right. Smoking. Can do you no harm. I didn't say you that. Host, what did you say? I said smoking can be safer. That's what the theme of my book is. At the time of the it? title was not my fault. The publisher. Said, what is the title, sir? The title is It Is Safe to Smoke. Good. All right, sir, continue. That is not my title. Who is it, the American Tobacco Company? No, I didn't look. I have no connection with any tobacco company. I guarantee you that. No, I was only asking about the title. Uh, it's Fred Turner's title. He's president of Hawthorne Books. Fred thought of a good title. It's He's giving you a lot of uh, action on that. He head. also made me a lot of enemies among the scientists I interviewed, if you want to know the truth. Because of the title? Yeah, not because of the book. They all thought it was a good book. But the, the title, title, the title really annoyed me. Let me ask it, Mr. Will we and finish? No, I know. I'm going to get back to you in a moment because uh, already you're going to be talking about girls and I know you don't no, know much about that. Oh, electronics. Uh, let me for a moment ask you, Mr. Stan, you've seen the blue book. Yes. Uh, are you impressed with it? Not very really much, no. Um, some of the material is good, some is bad, some is miserable, frankly. There have been so many changes of policy during the course of the blue book program that this is inevitable. In fact, if you go back as far as uh, Ruppelt's uh, original book, when he was, uh, shortly after he had left uh, command of the program himself, he acknowledges this in his own writing, which I think is probably the most detailed that you, is available now on the early history of uh, Blue Book. He points out, for instance, that there was a time when about 10% of the cases actually being called to the Air Force's attention were actually being put down in the Blue Book program. They simply weren't able to cope with the rest of them. Uh, and this was not by any means for a week. It went on for months that a great deal of the material wasn't recorded at all. And when the policy was to favor the idea that there was something important here that should be investigated, a lot of work got done and be a time when somebody up above uh, poo pooed the whole program or be played down to where they were practically doing nothing but shuffle papers. So I don't, I don't have uh, too much confidence in the Blue Book material. But how about the people on Blue Book? This is what I was referring to. They're all to. nice guys. Oh, well, they're all so pretty sharp guys. They try their best. They're well, on. If they, if they try on. their best, and I wouldn't doubt that they are trying their best. Uh, they're not hiding anything from the American public. How do you public. know? That's what I mean. How do you know? Well, I know them. Well, well I, what do you mean that you know them? I doubt that. That doesn't mean that, that you know. You mean... Why are they spending $300,000 with... Uh, what's the name? The University of Colorado. Condon. 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 Condon University of Colorado. 350000 roughly. And uh, why are they doing this? No. For this very reason. The public thinks they're hiding something. They turned over the project to Condon at the University of Colorado, and he has a completely free hand. He can release 
Well, that's not quite accurate. They don't turn over the project. No, the project blue book is still going on quite right. independently. Okay. Con you're, you're right. uh, Condon is conducting an independent investigation. He's supposed to have access to all the blue book material. What uh, much good it'll do him, I think. But uh, it's quite independent of blue book, which continues. Well, yes, except that he has an absolutely free hand and can make his own investigations and can release his decisions or his committee's decisions without even consulting the Air Force. Incidentally, I have a flash for you on that. Uh, I spoke to him day before yesterday, and I'm told, yes, I'm told there will be no uh, release of a public statement for quite a long time, perhaps not until the end of this first phase of this investigation, which may be uh, late 1967. Well, this is because the guy's a scientist and he's playing it cautiously. Well, well that is what he told me. He said it's simply they snowed under there with uh, work. In fact, when I called him, uh, I was dumbfounded to find that the first person that spoke to me on the phone was him, which would give you an idea of how heavily staffed they are out there. And he said, uh, frankly, he'd been so pestered by calls and one thing and another that he uh, decided they were going to have to do something else, that they were being just inundated with uh, information and inquiries at this time. They really haven't got very far with it yet. No, that's true. Not even get underway. Harris Lamont, what do you think about that? Of course, you did the article in the Cavalier magazine. Have you read any of Mr. Mallon's uh, articles? No, I haven't. That should be an interesting experience. Uh, I think that it's um, even more interesting, uh, more interesting than the fact that he has articles in the magazine, that he is an expert on the field. I question whether there has ever been an expert on the field of flying saucers or UFOs, which I distinguish one from the other. Uh, it it seems to me that since the Air Force admits it cannot explain portions of the sightings, has always had 26, 615, there's always a number that it uh, just sloughs off completely. It's since, a, uh, a number of, I mean, well, let him finish for a moment, Mr. Mallon, give you really an, an opportunity to. Oh, it's his phraseology. Go ahead. I mean, you, he, get, he can't use those phrases here? Oh, well, he can. Uh, the, the he's a moderator now? Come on, Lloyd. I have practice. maybe a unique idea. Let's let him finish a statement before we rip it And apart. then you clobber him all you want. All right. All right. Go ahead, Mr. Summer. After which I'll teach you phraseology. Uh, the, um, the simple situation is that all of the experts have been people um, either genuinely curious and collecting what fragments of data are available and trying to put them together into some sort of cohesive intelligence framework, and from that drawing some sort of conclusion, the more intelligent the uh, conclusion is, the more the tentative the conclusion usually. And so since basically it's a subject uh, about which virtually nothing is really known, uh, there is no hardware, there are no really concrete photographs, there are no good films, there, there, there is no... Uh, data uh, in, in, in any really concrete or uh, practical sense. And so it's all speculation. And I hesitate to, to, uh, um, to credit anyone as an expert uh, when the basis of their expertise lies in speculation. I think there are informed people on the subject, and um, I'm even willing to be convinced that Mr. Mallon is one of those both of the evening, uh, but uh, not from what he says so far. Now, Mr. Mallon. Touche. Well, I agree with you. Speaks you French? <laughs> no, I agree with you. a handicap already. I agree with you, uh, and this may surprise you. I, it ends the argument, I'm afraid. No, it doesn't end the argument, because uh, by expertise you don't mean, this, I mean, I at least don't mean someone who understands what a UFO is, but who understands a funny lot. I mean, it's a mixture of <laughs> terms right there. Yeah, I mean, okay. it argues with itself. Well, if we go back to that, I'm sorry, Sal, but I can say. If we go back.
like that, we can even quarrel about what we mean by an expert, oh. because if you know uh, more about a given subject than anybody else or than most people, then you must almost per se uh, be, comparatively speaking, an expert on a subject, even though you don't know much, if you know more than somebody else. You had a lot of modifiers in there. Well, well, you know anything that uh, doesn't require a few modifiers about this field? Well, that's my point. The, the, uh, to call anyone an expert simply because they know more than someone else. Uh, um, for example, we can have someone who knows a great many of the contactee stories. Doesn't knows nothing about the well, uh, UFOs. Well, I would say an expert on contactee stories. I mean, supposing somebody... But he wouldn't be an expert on flying saucers. All right, John would certainly be the man. He's very good at that. I possibly know right. more than I anybody agree. in the business. I would buy that. And, uh, as a matter of fact... Uh, Anything else I don't? Most people don't even... Uh, aren't even really familiar with this, and they call themselves experts on uh, UFOs, and they really know nothing about the contactee aspect of it. Have you but, ever interviewed a contactee? Yes. What was his name? Uh, his name was Noonan. Alan Noonan, out in Los Angeles. In fact, he told me that he... Oh, you really <laughs> the one got away. <laughs> <laughs> he, he even described the architecture of the cities on the planet Venus to me. Yeah. Very straightforwardly. He shook me up a little, by the did way. You, did you... Have you used it in, in uh, no, your articles? No, no, no. Because... So would you later, would you t tell us some of these things? Sure, Let I me repeat what he told you. No, yeah, I have a tape recording of it. No, I don't want, I want you to tell me. Well, I hope I can remember. Right. Okay. Uh, right. Yes, uh, I love to uh, talk to experts. Uh, look, let's drop that word, because what I meant when I said I agreed with the uh, Paris is... No, Paris. 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 No, but the right. 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 The, right. the fact is remember. that Mr. Shad said that he likes to talk with experts. The fact that now you don't want to be one does not necessarily no. mean that from mom and Stan don't consider themselves experts. Well, I prefer, to, I prefer to be an informed person. Oh, I what I, meant, person. I, said, I agree you with her. I was looking at you, and, I, and if I were you, I would have presented my remark, too. So I apologize, all right? You're not an expert. But haven't you never apologized on this program? Oh, I well, always apologize. I continually <laughs> Yes, uh, I, and this is an interesting way of setting people up, if I know well, Such men are dangerous, I believe. Uh, that's a anyway, to go on, there's a magazine called Flying Saucers, as you all know, put out by Look Magazine, and I think there's a lot of bright people, since Look Magazine, I think, is a fine magazine, and it's made up of bright people. They gathered a lot of bright people. Together and they got a lot of innumerable pieces of information like photographs and stories. And they finally, after culling it all, put out this pretty interesting magazine. And after it's all supposedly the best, I would say that they say, well, this is about as good as you can get from this series, and this is about as good as you can get. And finally, we have this in front of us, and we look at it, and it's a pretty color photograph, it's pretty as it can be. But <laughs> it doesn't say anything. It simply says we don't agree that there are any flying saucers. <laughs> and then I look carefully, being a photographer, I said, well, now I'm going to be, uh, let's, let, let me be open. Let me be as open as I can. Uh, maybe there is a, maybe there was a flying saucer somewhere in here that, that, you know, but every single photograph in here could easily be tricked with such ease. Right. right. So that the magazine is interesting, and I looked it over and had lots of fun. I've talked to many of you guys over the years, different flying saucer people, you, uh, you know, on a bright, but UFOs, if you will, people. And always at the end, I get what is a beautiful photo colored photograph, analogously in my mind, which is faked. That's, what, that's, that's the feeling I finally get. I'm giving you my character in relation to flying saucers. Now I have these <laughs> several questions for all of you. I mean, Paris, I know, I've known him for many years, and, and he and I, I believe, agree on the situation. You pose a one thing, flying saucers, something else. That's a very important point, by the way. Extremely important.
Uh, well, let's see if we can all agree on a definition, then. I would... Uh, a new flow is, uh, is a thing that uh, has... What it happened. says it is. <laughs> That's right, just what it says, not identified. And it's flying saucer is what other people call things that they think they see in the air from what I feel. Is that pretty good? Feel? Well, if you would put one inside as a part of the other definition, then... No, I don't know. You can put one near the other. This, sir, I, new flows are precisely what they say. They are, they are unidentified. Well, you know, aerial phenomena. Flying saucers are those... Sight or apply to uh, the description applies to those sightings wherein the viewer claims to have observed a craft of any type, size, shape, or description, but a vehicle presumably, uh, presumably intelligently controlled, probably extraterrestrial. I would agree with that. Would oh, you, would you say that was well, possibly this may be. landed and people got out? Yeah. So right. 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 If you want to define it that way, I'll go along Would with you that. agree with sure. that? I'll go along with it for the discussion, but I'm sure that's not the uh, added, the feeling that uh, most of our audience have about what they mean when they Well, let's try to get it. Flying <laughs> but unfortunately, that is, that, that's the problem. They, they don't sure. make any distingu a dis a distinction between the two. Well, well, let us just say that a saucer is, in point of fact, some sort of craft. Otherwise, it's a UFO. Oh. And they, you have to make a distinction between the two if you... Why did Ken Arnold, 20 years ago, when he was interviewed by the press, this Idaho businessman, why didn't, when, when the reporter said, well, can you describe it, why didn't he say it's unidentified and it was a flying, it was, it was an object? Instead, he said, gee, that's pretty tough. It was, well, it was like a saucer flying through the air. That's, and you know the history of it as well Charles, as I know. The best thing I could find out was that he described it as moving like a saucer that you might skip across the water like we've all thrown flat oh, rocks right. and skip out. And apparently the reporter or the stringer for AP or somebody like I that was AP. coined the phrase that it was a flying saucer. I don't think Arnold originally said that. Well, no, you're right. Mr. Arnold. I mean, he's right. Oh, he is right. Okay. Yeah, okay. Well, Frank well, that ends that. Let's all go home. I I think that's that's my score. score. That's There's one that. for me. I'm <laughs> just marking it down. Yeah, I just say this to you. Uh, you guys aren't very serious, are you? <laughs> oh, we're very serious. Very serious. Very serious. Well, all right, let me tell you something. When did you speak with Mr. Arnold? I never spoke with Mr. Then how are you in a position to score this already? Because I went through his file, which is a very thick file. What do you mean? Which quote? Data Project Blue Book. Kenneth Arnold's file? Yes, I have a Xerox copy of it at home. Well, I know Kenneth Arnold. Okay. That's better than you. Yeah, I've had him on the show. That's better than you. It's 20 years so later. So I'm going to score. All I can tell you is that Kenneth I'm Arnold has one said to me score. on my program, and I'll tell you the time when David Susskind had, was the Armstrong Circle Theater, I think was the name of the show, and Doug Edwards, I think, was the MC. And the keyhole. Yeah, the keyhole was on. Yeah, yeah. They cut him off the And air. then there was a man, uh, uh, an astronomer, I forget, from uh, uh, Harvard. Yes. Came down. Wasn't that uh, Manswell? I, I, I'm at a loss. I'm, I'm, I'm sorry, I can't say. And Kenneth Arnold, though, however, did not appear on the program, although he was in town. And at that time, I didn't know David Susskind. He didn't know me. In fact, his name didn't mean too much to me, and my name meant nothing to him. But he sent a telegram. I think you were associated with me in those days, right. if I'm not mistaken. He sent a telegram and said, be fair, and don't do anything till you call us to find out what actually took place. They had cue cards, which was not wrong, believe me. Because in other words, you've got a time to show. It isn't a free swinging show like we're doing here. And on the cue cards, they told Kenneth Arnold what to say. And he didn't want to say that. And Kenneth Arnold, the next day, that afternoon, was on my pro. We taped it. I mean, I didn't do an afternoon show in those days. And he described it as a flying saw. This is what he claimed. Now, maybe Kenneth Arnold is wrong, because I wasn't there 20 years ago when the no. statement was made. No, no. All I'm saying is that he made, I mean, his 
verbatim statements were recorded. By whom? By these Air Force investigators who interviewed him. And it's in the file at Project Blue Book, and this is what I waded through. It's a very thick file. All I was trying to say is, I mean, I'm not taking sides again. All I'm saying is that Kenneth Arnold was the man who started the whole business, really. I just said that before you did. Yeah. Well, I'm glad that you uh, score one for me. Which is not a whole <laughs> check, just a, you know, just a, like a, a little dot there. You know what I mean? Because I, I don't want to get a whole score. Big Town is turned on by the sound of Lee Leonard's voice. So is he. Weekdays at 1 on the big voice of Big Town USA, WNBC, New York. And before we get back with our guests, I'd like to take a moment to talk about Chinese New Year. Hey, if you're a little confused about some of the things we've been talking about so far, may I remind you that one of our guests, Mr. Stanton, who has uh, really spent a lot of time investigating uh, flying saucers, and he has written a book titled uh, Flying Saucers, Hoax or Reality. He's going to be giving a lecture at the Hotel Woodstock. That's tonight, Friday night, 127 West 43rd Street, 7.30 p.m. And uh, that is when the door is open. The lecture begins promptly at 8.30. And there will be a question and answer period, and you'll have the chance to talk with them. Now back with our guests. We're talking this morning with uh, Jerome Stanton who's an electronics engineer, and he's been a science writer for many, many years, and he's responsible for the book title Flying Saucers, Hoax or Reality. Lloyd Mallon is a science writer. He has contributed many articles to the magazine Science and Mechanics, and his newest book is titled, and uh, Fred will at least be happy if I mention it. <laughs> right. uh, it's safe to smoke. It is safe to smoke. the is. Well, I used it uh, as a contraction. Right. It's safe to say. Uh, were you offended? No. Turn because it. I didn't put the apostrophe in well, when I said it. sure will be offended. I'm not. I wish he had. I not even care less if Fred is offended. <laughs> really, I won't lose a second sleep if Fred is offended. <laughs> Taz Lamont is with us, writer and poet, uh, who has written uh, an article that appears in the current issue of Cavalier. Uh, the March 1967 issue, and uh, there's a lot of contactee stories incorporated in um, his article, which is titled Flying Saucers and the Death of God. And uh, we've uh, invited Roy Shatt to be with us because Roy is not a believer, but certainly interested in these uh, things. Roy, we'll give it back to you, and you might toss out a question. Yes, yeah, so I would like to uh, say before I go over to your she was smoking business, you know, you're allowed to smoke. I want to get, ask some questions about that. But I'd like to talk about something that has probably given us something like a million more contactees. And that is, was it last night when a great fireball was seen from Alaska down the western coast to until it hit the, somewhere on the western coast until it finally, after it was called a UFO, very clearly over all the media, it finally was found out to be not a UFO, but a very clearly defined object that they knew about. It was a piece of a Russian satellite orbit, if not this satellite, that finally was affected enough by gravity to come out of its orbit and hit the Earth. We all have heard of it, haven't we? And so we're nodding our heads. Now, here we have people with an imagination looking up there, and we're all different, looking at a gorgeous, great, big, flashing thing coming down through the sky into our atmosphere. Uh, now that we know about it, we can figure out what happened like a shooting star, a meteor, comes through to the atmosphere, and it, because our atmosphere is thicker, it gets friction, it lights up. And so we can figure out why things have happened. And so people with an imagination say, hey, that, before it was, we were told what it is, 
they tell us what they saw. And according to the, uh, the kind of atmosphere around them, which might be thicker, more moisture, to make it disfigure the shape of it, to, you know, as it gets nearer to the earth, to spread out and uh, have a different kind of a shape. Yeah. By the time it gets to the ground, you've got an, a, a, at least a million people who might have seen it give you a million different stories. I'm saying this is the way you can get flying, saucer, contact, these stories. Do you agree, Mr. Mallon? I agree. Sir, no, I, uh, I disagree with that entirely. Where is the contact? Yes, well, I'm not saying it's a story by definition. No, we're shaking no, hands no, with no, 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 That no, they no, saw a uh, flying yeah, saucer. Yeah, really, that I agree with that. That's how you know. They yeah, saw, and they may say they saw something that looked like so, uh, because of the misshapen uh, conditions that the atmosphere might right. give it. I, I'm sorry, you're quite right. The word contact is wrong. However, the imagination, if the same great imaginations were went to work and assumed many other things, you might very well come out with little green right. men. Uh, point of fact, you see a UFO, some people with the imagination uh, you attribute to them uh, interpret it as being a flying saucer, and if they really have something they want to sell or, or have problems, it, it may land in their backyard and people step out of it. I'd like to say one thing. You mentioned little green men. I've heard a tremendous number of contactee stories. Uh, I only vaguely remember hearing somebody talking about little green men, but no one that I've ever talked to ever saw these little green men. Most of the people that I've heard about are people of average height. Uh, if, if, if you could use something that would maybe be a little different, golden eyes and always had a spiritual look on their oh, face. These these are the type of uh, names. But other than that, in too. fact, when, when, when Menger was the big man around town, Menger used to tell us that these men are working in gasoline stations and banks and places like that. You can't have little green men in banks, there, you know, unless they're in the safe deposit box. have little green bills, though. That's uh, right. We're we're all eyes. Eyes. We're we're all over. Over. <laughs> That's right, working all over. So I've never heard these descriptions except once in a while somebody would say about somebody that was peculiar looking compared to what we thought that people looked like. The only one I remember was the West Virginia. There was a West the Virginia site, but uh, around that time there were uh, well, this whole family some that shot small people in the West Virginia. Virginia. The only time I you know, these were described as little people about uh, three feet high, but I think they were silvery, weren't they? But the German, uh, the one in this Germany. Apparently not, not in the. Uh, uh, was it West Virginia? I think yeah, it was. Well, there was, but the, the little silver man that, uh, of which the photograph uh, uh, um, was taken, presumably, and published uh, here and there, uh, and uh, accompanied by two men in raincoats who were uh, uh, frequently uh, uh, described as being FBI or Secret Service men flown over from the United States. And he was, it was a fascinating photograph, a little man about two and a half feet tall. And he's silver, obviously, sort of uh, iridescent. And two men, uh, a la uh, Barker, in the coats on either side. And this little tiny figure holding the hands like, you know, Mama and Papa. Is, uh, but that's the only um, silver. Well, we have heard, heard of Brazil, that. too, where these two fellows are supposed to be driving a truck. Oh, yes. These were about three feet high. And but they're pretty rare. Ninety-nine percent. But you notice, gentlemen, normal the high flying people. saucers. Uh, book that we have, not one little man is photographed. Uh, we do oh, have the Frank Sasser Burger, you're talking about uh, the Columbus Columbus magazine. Columbus magazine. Uh, 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 are but really there are a couple of photographs of those. Oh, sure. little oh little I'm sure there, there must be. Uh, not I, bad. I, I, I'm there sure there's no wish. But along with this, the imagination has given us all kinds of ways of go uh, building stories, and I'm saying that we need massages once in a while. Uh, after all, life can become boring. When a great streaking light comes across the sky, we can add all kinds of things to it if we want to. I'd like to talk about your smoking now for a moment. You say it may be, these are your words. I'm not you're taking no, their words. Say, I'm being kinder to you. My words are it can be. It can be. That's your that. It can be safe to smoke. Right. Tell us a little about that. Well, I'm awfully sorry, <laughs> Mr. Shepard. We did this just the other night. Oh, I'm sorry. We did the uh, the show with him. We, my 
might, a little later in the morning we might get into this, but I think it would be unfair to Paris and to uh, uh, Jay, uh, because, and, and even to uh, Lloyd, because Lloyd is making a, a classical buck, loading science and mechanics. They don't pay that well, by the way. Well, that's your problem. That's your hang-up. They pay not pay at all after that. <laughs> well, I have another question, then. It was mentioned before that 60, and I thought this was a very poor argument that you gave, extremely poor, 60 different craft must have been from different places outside our universe or somewhere. And isn't it possible that they could all come from one place? Well, it's possible, but if this is so, then the people are at that one place, for my money, are very poor engineers. Why so? We not know. only got not here from us, we all overlap. Uh, how many different craft do we have just uh, that we sent to Vietnam? Oh, now you're talking about military craft. I'm sorry, sir, but you see, these can be easily... All right, uh, all right, I can just quickly, without going into a lot of detail, tell you that among the high-performance aircraft, we're using four different types. One of them's almost obsolete. Uh, among the uh, reconnaissance-type aircraft, some of them overlap because, for example, the F-105, which is a single-seat fighter, also has a version for reconnaissance called the RF-105, which is a two-seater. This is equally true of the F-4C. All right, now let me tell you something. The Russians have a few planes, too, and so do the other countries and they're all different shapes. Now, would you agree? No, they're not basically different shapes. They have to have an aerodynamic shape. Uh, but they do look different. Uh, now, uh, we can... Not easily. essentially. Only in terms of no, the general... No, we can different kinds of helicopters alone, of course, course not, let alone... Uh, but let they, but they, but they all happen to have the type of airfoil system that keeps a helicopter up in the air, right? But a a whirling... I mean, they have a whirling disc. I mean, it's a disc as a world. But, Tom, I think you're really uh, trying to argue. Oh, no, well, I'm saying there, 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 there are different airplanes, enough but, different ones from one but planet these called 60, Earth. Right? No, but these 58 to 60 different configurations were distinctly different. You look in the magazine there. There are drawings of them. Well, uh, them look, uh, oh, wait. No, I'm serious. Well, I'm you serious, can recognize, too, I look, sure. No matter how many different versions, of a helicopter there are. You can recognize it as a helicopter, right? You're quite right. And an airplane. Let's qualify that a little. If you're reasonably uh, sophisticated about uh, our type of aircraft that fly by accelerating a mass of air downward, yes, you could say that's a helicopter and that's a helicopter, but supposing that you are an ignorant savage, uh, we are supposed to presume, if we believe these stories about uh, flying saucers being uh, actually vehicles controlled by intelligent beings from somewhere else, that they are far uh, superior to us in technology. Right, that's we might have an point. analog here. We might be the savages who would not as readily recognize things as being, uh, in fact, the same kind of vehicle yes. as the savage in the center of New Guinea who might not be able to pick out one helicopter and say, well, that's essentially... Uh, generically the same thing as that one over there. Let alone seeing four or five different types of planes. I'm not even Mind you, I don't buy category. that for a minute, what I said there, but I'm just pointing out that this argument doesn't hold water too no, well. It's very well, boring. I would think that even a savage who has no background in aerodynamics, if he saw three different designs of helicopter fly over the treetops okay. and then saw three different high-performance jet airplanes, fly over the same treetops, he would be able to distinguish the helicopter as such from the aircraft, airplane as such. Generally speaking, I would agree. Unless he's really stupid, and I don't think savages are as stupid well, as the average okay. intelligent oh, well, let's, human let's, being. Let's so get called get one right. point clear. Uh, just one point here, because it applies directly. Uh, there's no reason to believe that he would see a dis distinguishing characteristics, because Native One sees 
either. It makes no difference which one of the craft. Well, coming over to what I just A week later, the native two sees it, and they say, we saw a great bird. And what great silver bird, great right. silver bird in the air, great silver bird moves fast, and With you can have long sorts of modifying characteristics. Yeah, but I, I, I think you guys are simplifying this because a high-performance jet fighter has a minimum speed at which it can operate. When it falls below, say, 150 knots, it's going to fall out of the sky. A helicopter travels much more slowly, makes a lot more noise, believe me, because a jet engine is directional in its noise. No, the, 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 we're belaboring this point. The yeah, all get out. Let's get something else. Well, it's but, blue book oh. situation. All right. Well, I mean, we can well, go on and on saying, gentlemen, if you will, from up, don't overlap, please. It makes it difficult for our listeners, uh, Mr. Mallon, if you listen to the question and then right. take, you know, plenty of uh, time to answer it. Uh, this blue book. I'd like you to tell me what it is first. I think the listeners, some, most of them must know, but some of them do not. What is the Blue Book? Well, you mean very simply, because there's a complex history to it, as Stan can tell you. Uh, Project Blue Book began, I think, was it shortly after or just prior to Kenneth Arnold's? Uh, well, it wasn't started. called Project Blue Book. It was called the was was project British. started up by the Air Force in 1948 to investigate these reports that were coming in. Which is then after Arnold. After yes, it was, after it was Arnold. slightly after. The first one was Sign, wasn't it? Sign, Project Grudge. Sign was the then first Grudge. name it had. Then, then it was changed to Project Grudge. Uh, to Mr. Stanton, tell us what it is, please. Would I you? I, I, we're overlapping terribly. Oh, I agree. That's true, we are. Yes, uh, Mr. Stanton, no, please well, explain what it is. This thing actually was the Air Force's way of dealing with uh, the reports that were persistently being uh, sent in to local authorities like the police who then bucked it up the line to the uh, military authorities about things being seen moving through the air that people on the ground were unable to identify as being something they knew about. Of course, uh, whether or not they actually could be shown later to be something that was identifiable is another thing. The people who reported them were unable to say well, we saw the uh, 727 uh, jetliner fly over last night at 543. They would just say, we saw something pass over there we couldn't explain. And the Air Force got enough of these reports uh, in the few months following the first report from Arnold that they set up a project that is a group of people specifically assigned to the duty of looking at these reports and trying to figure out whether or not there was anything here that was a threat to the security of the country that the Air Force naturally has That wouldn't be the first that thing that they would right. react. That's the basic reason. That's the right. I think now, it's important the first the name for this group of people, uh, the first code name which they assigned to it within the Air Force, was Project Sign. It had only two people. Yes, I did. And it started yeah. off with yeah. two people yeah. uh, and, and a couple and of and clerks who shuffled uh, papers and so on. But that's another thing. Uh, one of the reasons that I don't think that the Project Blue Book is, is now the name of this continuing function uh, within the Air Force to analyze these reports, one of the things I'm not notably impressed by it is the fact that uh, the size of the staff of people doing the work over the years has gone up and down like a yo-yo, depending on the immediate importance that was assigned to it within the Air Force, depending, you might say, on who happened to be in command at the time. And uh, It's never been, a, uh, any, by any stretch of the imagination, a large group. It's always been. No, I very think the biggest staff that group had at well, the time of the biggest flat there after that Washington do. Yeah, 52. Uh, he had, I think, 11 people. I uh, counting I, himself. Yes, at the most. Uh, yes. May I add something here with that? Yeah, part time workers quite often, too. They weren't even fully assigned to well, Yes, I would like to add something because this is often overlooked. The staff down at Wright Patterson Air Force Base, which is headquarters for Project Blue Book, is small, except at their command, and they have no budget, they can call on anybody in the Foreign Technology Division of the Air Force Systems Command, which is the intelligence gathering section. And they can also call on any...
anybody at any U.S. Air Force base in the entire world to act as an investigator. They have the authority of the United States, States behind them. Correct? That's right. That's right. So therefore, you can't merely look at the small staff down at Wright-Patterson Air Force Base and say this is Project Blue Book, because it isn't, basically. Project Blue Book covers maybe, well, it could be as many as 5,000 investigators. Well, I think you'll jump with that. to find out who will that be. I'm going to ask you now, if you'll give me a chance. Project Blue Book, the term, the code name, applies only to the people actually whose full time job is they're officially assigned to analyze these reports. Now, the fact that they can get information from any Air Force base around the country doesn't enlist all the people who send them information as a part of the Project Blue Book team. This is something a guy might do in 15 minutes out of his whole day at some other Air Force this base. This is not true. I hate to interject this, but it's not true. They can assign, they have the authority to call on any intelligence officer at any Air Force base, U.S. Air Force base. Do you but agree with that, Mr. Stanton? No, I don't. That well, doesn't we have a well, why can you disagree with facts? Wait a minute. Everything you say We're isn't a fact automatically. No, that's not a fact. You say it all the time. The fact that I can ask, uh, for instance, oh. today I called up uh, an editor at uh, Aviation Week to get a phone number. That doesn't mean that he is part of my staff or whatever I would call it. My staff usually consists of me. Uh, the fact that I can call on somebody for information or ask him to look up something for me doesn't automatically put him under my command. That's exactly the situation that exists with the Project Blue Book. If they get a report from, well, now they can't order somebody out at another Air Force base. You go and investigate the saucer. They ask them for information. No, no, they can order someone. They have the authority to where do you, just a moment. You can check this out. Hold on just a second. Where do you go? You tell us. You say you know. This is a fact. All right. Prove to us Where right did I now. get the information? Yes, I'd like to know. I got it for, from Major Hector. Tanelia Jr., who was chief of Project Blue Book. I got it from Colonel George Freeman, who was the Pentagon liaison on this particular project. I got it from Colonel Maston Jacks, who is director of a whole section of the information uh, section of the in the office of the Secretary of the Air Force. And they all told they, they all told they all told you that they have the authority to, to order man to order people. To give them information. Is this true, Mr. Stanton? You disagree with them. I'd like to know why. Well, they can ask for information from any place in the world, as far as I can make out. And I've talked to the same people that. But they do have the backing of the U.S. government at the time. They can. I can make out. And I've talked to the same people that. But they do have the backing of the U.S. government at the time. They can ask. Can yes. They? Right, but that doesn't mean that the man at the other end of the pipe that they ask is under their command and has perforce to drop whatever else he's doing and go out in the field and look for something for them. Oh, may I add this? At each base, there is an intelligence officer who is called the face UFO investigator. And he has to go out and do the investigation as he's asked to do this by Blue Book. Well, Paris, you, uh, you're, you're aware of all this, too. How, how would you vote on this? Oh, I think it's ridiculous. It's like saying that... Well, uh, well, 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 if you go by that, yeah, then, yeah, Alan, but is there, I mean, just because how many hundred Air Force bases are there? If we go by that, then the Project Blue Book staff is going to be up in the hundreds, more than the hundreds. If I can, I'll answer the I question for you entirely. Yeah. Yeah. I'm asking Paris if I can, I'd like um, to uh, get past three or four words into the sentence before I'm interrupted. Uh, it's absurd for this reason. It's the equivalent would be to say that the um, medical staff of a hospital consisted of not, or let's say the operating staff, the surgical staff of a hospital, not all the interns and residents, but particularly the, the department that uh, handled surgery, oh, consisted of the surgeons, yes. plus the nurses, plus the attendants, plus the interns, plus the ambulance drivers, plus the attendants that went on in the ambulance calls, plus anybody in the street who happened to call up when somebody got injured. 
Of course, anybody who uh, <coughs> collects, collects information, uh, almost I would say, uh, I can't think of any exception offhand, would have access to information provided by innumerable people. Uh, any writer finds this. He goes out and he may interview a hundred people. These people have nothing to do with him directly, and yet all of them may respond if he calls. Now, if you want to put it in, the, in terms where the person has to respond, it's uh, like, uh, oh, the State Department is in a position where it virtually can force uh, a citizen anywhere in the world to, if it's absolutely essential for a, a national emergency, I mean, you could call upon a citizen and, and well, let's not name any country and get into complications, but any place in the world and say, look, your, your government needs you to do this, and 99 times out of uh, 100, because the State Department or the CIA, whatever it was, the Council, uh, had the authority uh, of the United States government behind them, they represented the country, the American citizen would say yes, if it was possible, he would accommodate them. And in these terms, of course, everybody is a member of the State Department, everybody is a member of whatever you want them to be a member of. But Blue Brook, as um, Dan has said, is specifically a, uh, an organization, uh, very small, and never properly equipped or properly staffed a group, uh, which was put together originally and still exists to uh, not collect particularly, but to evaluate the uh, reports from all over the world. They get reports, uh, probably the majority of the reports don't come from uh, service personnel at all. They come from all over the world, others, other uh, governments, other uh, uh, military uh, organizations, uh, laymen and what have you, scientists, pilots. Uh, the purpose of the, this group is to uh, collate and uh, eva uh, evaluate uh, these I'd like to pick up the word evaluate. Pardon me for just yeah. a moment, Paris. The word evaluate uh, immediately, I'm sure, <coughs> would hit many listeners and say, well, when they evaluate, do they, are they the scientists and engineers and mathematicians and physicists who are able to test and train? How do they evaluate? Well, unfortunately, I think, <coughs> pardon, that's, that's one of the uh, great drawbacks uh, in all of the Air Force investigations, particularly, of course, in uh, Blue Book. Uh, one would assume for evaluations of this sort, yeah. one would, would need precisely uh, the kind of personnel you, uh, of which you spoke. Uh, astronomers, astrophysicists, engineers, uh, specialists in aerodynamics, uh, radar specialists, and so on and so forth. All the, and some really, uh, uh, I don't know how computers go in category, but at least a, a good computer. I would say a computer, yes. Uh, oh, and point of fact that um, well, I'm sure Mr. Mallon's going to say, well, they have access to these people. Of course they do. But why, with the kind of money we're, we're spending all over the world for uh, incredible things, yeah. we can't afford to have a top astronomer there at all times, a top uh, astrophysicist or whatever is necessary, a staff of 100 people there, since this, has, this uh, entire business has gone on for now a quarter of a century. We have no real answers for it. Uh, I don't happen to uh, uh, regard it as a probable threat, but then I'm sure that uh, uh, the day uh, uh, the, um, the bomb dropped on uh, Hiroshima and Nagasaki, they didn't really think that uh, bomb coming over was a probable threat of annihilating the entire. You know, I don't know. I don't appreciate your analogy, but uh, I, I think that, I you, see what you're that because one does not regard something as a probable threat doesn't mean that it isn't. I just think, and all it doesn't appear to me to be any great threat well, because it's, these things have been going on for a couple of thousand years. May I say this, Paris and, and gentlemen, that uh, uh, if these, this magazine that Look put out called Flying Saucers, and I, they must have had a hell of a good group of people to check it, uh, scientists, etc., uh, or, or I don't know who they might have been, but really it becomes an unimportant situation. And I, it would seem to me I agree with you, well, Paris. My argument is that it's a socio-psychological situation. I would say that's true. It's not a and therefore, there in, in a so-called organization, which the Blue Book is, uh, is supposed to be a product of, uh, they would say, well, look, we're, we're using an awful lot of energy for a thing that doesn't appear to be very dangerous at all. 
And so uh, I would agree with you, Paris. Back with our guests. We are talking with uh, Lloyd Mallon, science writer, who's contributed many articles to the magazine Science and Canics. Uh, L. Jerome Stanton, who is the author of the book, uh, which is available now in paperback, published by Belmont. It's titled Flying Saucers, Hoax or Reality. And uh, then we have Paris Flamon, who... Uh, for a number of years was associated with the show, and he is a writer and a poet. And I must say that his article, unfortunately, none of the other fellows around the table have had a chance to read the article in Cavalier. Yes, I have. Oh, you did read it? I did see it. Fine. Well, we, uh, we'd hoped that we would have extra copies up here before the show, and we just didn't get them, but I think that uh, Paris did an excellent job. Uh, it is certainly different from what Mr. Mallon has done or what Mr. Stanton has done, and this is not uh, uh, meant in a critical sense to Mr. Stanton or Mr. Mallon because Paris has done it in a different way. He has uh, brought us up to date with uh, some of the contactee stories, and I have always been interested in the contactee stories because I, I think they're, they're fabulous, especially if the guy tells a good one, and who knows, maybe he's telling the truth. Roy Shad is with us, photographer. You know, I was just down this afternoon. Uh, uh, I took Jean Bolger, who is uh, George Skinner's uh, executive secretary. We went down to have coffee. And gee, I must say, the way you rearranged everything down there, put a lot of... We got Carmel. Yeah, Carmel the drugstore down there. We put down there. And uh, there's a great selection of pictures, not only of people that you hear... Uh, on uh, the shows that I do, but uh, uh, some of the uh, people that you hear and see on the Johnny Carson show, and some of the great actors and actresses that I have never had the Is pleasure you of meeting. Yes, of Paul Freeman? Yes, that's great. Paul Freeman, the sculptor, who is with us many times, and that's been added to the uh, uh, group of uh, photographs. So if, if you're around, you know, the RCA building, uh, we hope that you'll stop in and go into Cromwell's Pharmacy. And, uh, of course, don't go in there at high noon, you know, because they don't want you to be looking at Chad's pictures then. But go in, you know, when, you know, when the action is not too great. And, gee, the photographs are just great. I know you'll enjoy seeing them because... Uh, you know, the names are there, and you'll, you know, you'll see Sam Silver, Rabbi Silver, and Al Lotman, and Cena Hamilton, and uh, uh, Roberta Copper, and Anna Marie. No, I didn't put her back yet. I took one down. I did not like one with the Derby. i got to put her back up again. Roberta isn't down there now? She's not down there. Oh, that's 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 I know Anna Marie gets it. Yes, there. Yeah. So, take a look. You'll enjoy. Getting back... Uh, with our uh, guest. Uh, again, I, I think what we should do, though, uh, and you fellas haven't had the, a chance, and I have read the uh, article, uh, I would like to ask you, Paris, and really some of my questions are almost ridiculous for the simple reason that I could answer a lot of them myself, but uh, you were associated with the show for a long while, and I think I'll ask you what contactee story do you think was the one that sounded that it might be legitimate and yet uh, far out? And and, and, and and tell the story. Tell, you know, what, what the guy or the gal actually said. Is there any particular one that you... That's, um, that's very hard. Actually, I'm not sure that the uh, best one I, um, the best of the contactee storytellers was the one who told the most authentic sound they were on. Because I have a great weakness for Orfeo Angelucci's I tales. I think he's you probably... Must listen. You must listen. Oh, Did I give I, you that? I wanted to get, before I left this day, to get all the uh, times up, but particularly, uh, is this a new thing with Orfeo? No. Oh. Is it? Well, uh, You'll want to hear. It's, it's, the, it's the, the little girl. Oh, yeah, I mean, the little dancing yes. uh, girl. Well, it is fantastic. And that's only one of the... Uh, uh, I, it may be almost the best, but Orpio, uh, unlike other of the contactees, uh, 
and no matter how extravagant his, his claims were, you saw him sitting there, this little slight fellow, dark hair, he looks like a, a sketch uh, by an Italian Renaissance painter or something, and he's so sincere. And some of the others, naming no one in particular, uh, very if I may interrupt, is not a false sincerity either. Oh, no. Mm-hmm. Really? Yes. Did Dabsky make something of the same impression? No. No? No. 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 I've never met the man. And there's that's some that, that are... Yeah, and there's no. some that come on, you know, it's outright uh, cons, you know. No, I mean cons. And I won't identify which or which, but, uh, I mean, you have the entire range the, the, from the... The ones who were obviously in it to make a fast buck from the suckers as fast as quickly as they could and can, and then on to the next town, all the way through people that you kind of half believe, but know they're kind of uh, commercializing maybe something they halfway believe in, and then all the way over to Well, we Angelucci, all know that the best con is utter sincerity. That's why every con man has no, to no, believe in it. But uh, we're not that naive. Missed something. Uh, no. You've missed something, Jay. Uh, I have done, I don't know how many, I was going to say hundreds, that's a sure exaggeration because there aren't, there aren't hundreds to my knowledge, but say there are at, at least 30 or 40 of them. Yeah. And when we're through, you know, we're through, great, when you're coming back in town next time, call me and we're going to put you out because it's good for me, it's great for the show, and it's good for the guy who wants to make the pitch. There's only one man, and I remember when he wrote me, he went back to California, and when he, he sent me a letter, and, and I don't know if you can get the sincerity out of it that I did, he sent me a letter, and he thanked me for being out, and he said, I'm coming back, like in June, too much for now. And he said, I would like to have Paris and his wife, and you and your wife, be my guests at Tafanetti. <laughs> well, that, that's another thing, but, you know, it's, 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 it was so sincere, it was so lovely, so warm, that if he had come back at that time, and if there was any opportunity for me to take the time, I would have marched over to Tafanetti's with him, and sat uh, there. One of those rubber potatoes. <laughs> <laughs> no, it's, it's, it's just, it's kind of a... He was that sincere, and when he, when he would talk on the air, and when he would describe the little girl, which we're not going to do tonight because you can hear it Sunday, and when he would describe these things, I honestly believe, because, mind you, here is one guy that never made a buck. If he made a buck, if he ever made a, a fast $50 for giving a lecture someplace, he certainly must have spent a hundred and a half to get to the place to get the fifty. He, when I would say about his book, it was done and depressed. And I would say, where is the book available? You've got to give the guy a, a shake, right? He said, well, John, it, it, it's really not important. I said, well, I, I was in... Uh, Britannos, and I, I don't know if they were sold out, but, but I didn't see it there, see? You know, thinking, you say, well, uh, a lot of people write in. Nothing. He said, but John, it's just one of those things. He said, my book has not really been a very successful seller, and uh, I, I really don't care. It's just I want to tell people about it. Well, you, you, can't, you can't knock that. He's got you completely <laughs> cornered, though. In other words, he's willing to settle for the ego move. No, no, I no, think I'll go along with John for a while. I like no, to say something. He believes everything he John of Arc may very well have heard those voices. Oh, I'm not... Uh, I'm having a run. I'm not quarreling. I don't think I there are a lot of really believe when he comes back out of the desert. There are a lot of philosophy that he heard the voices. But the difference with Angel- yeah. uh, Angelucci yeah. is that he had not ex- talk that? over too much. You don't sorry. listen, Mom. I'm sorry. Uh, I'm sorry. I mean, you start talking, and then, of course, this should be a good take. I'm sorry. I uh, tend to anticipate what you're going to say. Okay. All right. Go ahead. Paris, I'm well, sorry. Just, just about uh, Arpio, the, uh, the thing that distinguished him from um, those who, let's say, uh, have visions, 
illusions, what have you, was, uh, and, uh, and, and are totally sincere, was that he had a marvelous ability to convey his uh, uh, experiences. And when you read uh, Ovio, it's, it's not like uh, reading most of the contactee stories. It's like reading uh, Hans Christian Andersen. There's a, there's a gentle beauty about, uh, and I don't mean he had great literary skill. Uh, he, he's not a, uh, certainly doesn't have the kind of uh, background we'd expect from somebody who uh, uh, would become a, a great fairy story writer. But uh, they have that quality. Unlike any other I've ever uh, come across, he would, <coughs> one incident where he meets Adam, who, uh, subsequently opened the entire uh, horizon of the solar system and beyond her. And his description of this uh, uh, position from Seattle, Washington, and how he sat in the cafe late at night, and uh, he, as a matter of fact, uh, just to give a very brief sketch of it, he walks into the cafe one night, it's out in the desert, and he sees this figure in the booth, and uh, I'm not going to choose the bed, but around it. And uh, he sees uh, uh, the fellow says, uh, hello, Orfeo, and uh, Orfeo is speaking, says, uh, do you know me? Well, I expected you, Orfeo. And he does this dialogue, and it's just, yeah. and he sits down, and he talks about how he, he feels this, the, the, you know, the beauty of this man, and he knew that, that his life had suddenly taken a, a turn that would develop an open, enormous horizon for him, and he proceeds to talk about Adam in a way that eventually, I don't know if he, uh, Adam is, is a, you know, right over somebody he knows or has not, but uh, if he isn't, then uh, Orvio has the ability to create a, a character uh, that writes with uh, anybody you want to name, including Amy or... If Orvio would have sold this book, not as a book based on fact. But as a fairy tale, yes. a fantasy, he would have, I, I'm not saying I'm the best seller, but he would have made a class to go back.